Thank you for being here. I was at the meetup last year. It was hosted by UCSF. It was a great event. I had the opportunity to meet with uh, members of this community. It was uh, um, refreshing and exciting to see how people can be so involved. And uh, as Pavel was saying, in 2019, this community delivered on many of its promises. You can see that things are uh, going forward. Uh, I wanted to talk about Human API. What are we excited about? Our vision, uh, what we do, try to answer this question, is Human API on fire? Uh, but probably some of you know, and some others would first start with the question, what the hell is Human API first? So I'd like to present this to you and go beyond what is on our website. Uh, so we, we started in 2013. We started with the observation that, and I guess everyone is going to agree with this, it's so hard for anybody, a patient, to get access to their medical records or their health data. And it's so hard for an enterprise, whether it's a business or a nonprofit, to get that data and do use it for something. Uh, and there was quite a puzzling question because, like, we started in 2013 and everyone had a mobile phone and everyone had internet and you could call a cab and like, but when it comes to health data, if you're sick and probably everyone has a similar experience for them or something, someone close, it's, it's a struggle. You have to print your records and get them, get a hard copy and move it somewhere. Uh, so we, we thought that there is something to be done there, and it's also a great business opportunity. Uh, if we want to foster innovation in healthcare, it always boils down to what we call data liquidity. The availability of data, the ability to exchange health data safely and for cheap. And we've been meeting hundreds of smart people and hearing great ideas. It always comes to the same thing. If we had the data from patients, we could do X, Y, and Z. So we went and tried to solve this problem. And doing so, we figured that uh, we could build a transaction layer, a ubiquitous transaction layer that is easy to use, that is available as a technology, but also available to people who are not technically savvy. Uh, and we have seen this change a lot of other industries. So those are examples in transportation and finance, for example. The, when you have such a network or such a transaction layer that is ubiquitous and easy to use, that fosters tremendous change beyond what we can think could happen. Uh, so we are trying to be that for healthcare because we think that there is no such thing and we want that to happen and be available to anybody. Uh, so we went and built our approach is really what we call consumer controlled. It's consumer centric and consumer driven. So the patient is in the middle of everything. On one side, you have access to all of these devices or um, patient portals or APIs or any what we call a data source. On the other side, there are people that can help you better if they had access to that data and if you want them to. So those people could be caregivers, it could be your health insurance, it could be an underwriter in insurance, it could be a clinical researcher. Uh, so what we do is to make this as easy as possible through a mobile UI or a web UI where we can mediate that transaction. Uh, and doing so, we had to figure out how to get the data. So we have built a clinical network. And it's the largest of its kind today. And we do all kinds of technologies that are available to us. We have almost 90% coverage of the United States. Any kind of data source, it could be labs, pharma, hospitals, wearable devices. So there is almost 90% chance that anybody here can transact their data from their provider using Human API. I see a lot of questions in people's heads. So if you want a demo, I can do a demo later, and I can show you how it works. So 
I mean, if you hear this, it makes total sense. Our vision is completely aligned with fire because that's what fire is about, is interoperability, making this easy for anyone, creating a standard. What we like about this standard is it's inclusive. Standards that came before were about the schema or the validity of the data, but not necessarily about how you can exchange that data. So FHIR has comes also with specs about the paradigm of exchanging the data, which we really like. It's also developer friendly. Anybody who knows the old HL7 would agree with this. And the name. Anything that is developer friendly has a name that is amenable to jokes and puns. And FHIR is great about this. Uh, third, uh, I think Pavel touched on this, but other people, probably other speakers will, will touch on this. 2019, 2018 have been great years for FHIR as a technology, as a community. It's growing at a faster pace and is getting traction, which we like. And last but not least, and probably all of you being here, braving the harsh California winter, uh, are a real evidence of this. Uh, it's a community I have next, next to nothing in the health IT landscape. And uh, we're really proud of being close to this and interacting with it. Then we're trying to be pragmatic. Uh, there are things that are still open questions for us. And I want to start this as a discussion with you today and later. How can we try to answer those questions and move faster in our adoption as a company of uh, FHIR as a standard? And the first thing is adoption is still low. At our scale, if we had to use only FHIR APIs in the United States, our network coverage would be much smaller and we would not be able to support all the use cases that we want to support today for our customers. So we would love to see a much bigger adoption of FHIR so that we can easily integrate with FHIR APIs. Uh, the second is we've done some research and we see that using formats of data like CCDA would yield more data that is otherwise not accessible through FHIR. And this is not to blame the standard itself because it's pretty comprehensive. It's the way providers make this accessible. So a lot of our um, use cases require deep and comprehensive data because in the clinical landscape, you need uh, the clinical realm, you need what you call the bigger picture. And for example, discharge instructions. Those are things we typically don't see coming out of our APIs, even if we compare the data that comes directly for the same patient in FHIR and CCD. So it's not that the provider doesn't have them. Either they made a choice or not to surface them, or it was a technical struggle, et cetera. As a matter of fact, this means there are use cases that you can support today with FHIR as long as that problem didn't get solved. And we want to be part of the solution. And last but not least, I don't know if everyone agrees with this, is that FHIR has extensibility built in as a core principle, but it's hard to say the least, especially if you're a mediator like us and you have to handle all the extensions from everybody and you have to do that smoothly. It's been a problem and maybe part of this is because we're not technically experts and some people have the solution for this. That's what I would like to hear from you. Uh, that's pretty much it. I wanted to say that we're hiring this handsome guy. He's not here today. He's our VP of engineering. He would love to talk to anybody who's seeking an opportunity to, to join us. Thanks, everyone, and welcome.